Joshua, as a computational biologist, uh, you have been focusing on artificial intelligence and all of your work in an applications basis. I want to take you beyond the computational work you're doing and looking and look at the broad implications of AI in terms of uh, what it means to be human, what consciousness means, um, and and to call upon your expertise in as a physician and even your uh, theological interests. Uh, so. Putting that all together in this uh, in this cauldron of, uh, of of personas that you have, uh, how do you view AI not as a tool for for investigation today, but as a potential for uh, extending what it means to be human uh, and transhumanism broadly? So there's a lot there. So um, we can start with transhumanism. Uh, there is. There's basically a larger secular voice of people wondering about, you know, what is the next evolution of human? And might there be a singularity? And what does it mean to be human beyond as we understand it now? Uh, some religious uh, folk are a little bit uncomfortable with that. But on the other hand, you know, in the, in the, Christian, in the Chris, Christian tradition, at least, there's this belief that, you know, the way we find ourselves human now isn't our final form. You know, <laughs> when, we're resurrected, when we're resurrected in the next life, there's going to be, uh, you know, glorified bodies we're going to get. So this idea that we're not in our final form, <laughs> there's this other type of human that could arise is actually, uh, actually one place where things are kind of converging between these two worlds. And that's what's making it interesting. Now, there's a lot of um, over-optimism, I would say, about technology in this space. Um, it's not really clear how you could, uh, with like, any sort of continuity of self, take a human consciousness and put it in a machine. Uh, but I think what we do see um, in AI in particular is a new ways to think about how different types of humans might arise and how it presses on our understanding of human. Now, of course, there are, is no AI that is a true artificial mind yet, but we're starting to see the beginnings of what that could and might look like right now. And what are some of the components of that? Well, um, there's probably three big unanswered questions. One um, is whether or not we can create an artificial mind. No one really knows if we can. What does that mean, an artificial mind? An artificial mind where it's like a true general intelligence, where it's like uh, it's human-like in that sense. It's like a human-ish mind. <laughs> I mean, of course, um, a, hum a true human, I mean, an artificial intelligence might be very different than a human intelligence in some ways. But can we even make a machine that has a consciousness? We don't really know the answer to that. The next question we don't really know is how to do that. Uh, some people have theories. If anyone comes to you confidently, no one really knows for sure. Mm -hmm. And third, which I think is really interesting too, is we don't really have an idea to, of knowing whether or not we've succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the one big change that's happened in, re in, in recent times is that there is actually a small group, it's a minority group that I think are wrong, but they're still actually out there of experts who actually understand how um, AI works that's convinced that we've already achieved consciousness of some sort. Yeah, that, that's really a fringe though. It's a fringe, but it's interesting to find out why, and like I said, I think they're wrong, yeah. um, but it's interesting to understand why and see why they're actually thinking that and, um, and why everyone disagrees with them and how to make sense of that and what might be different. So uh, where this is coming from is from large language models like ChatGPT, and they're able to communicate in a way that, uh, that makes some people wonder if they're sentient. Now, it's interesting. Now, I think most people would agree that if a chimpanzee stood up and was talking to us in the same way that ChatGPT, <laughs> or one of these language, uh, language models, is actually talking, then we actually, almost all of us, would conclude that that, that chimpanzee has a human mind, yeah. or a, a mind like a human enough that it would really dramatically change its eth ethical status and our sense of responsibility to it. Um, we, would, uh, we would treat it in a very different way. And in that sense, it would be granted many aspects of what we see as uniquely human worth and dignity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not coming out of uh, something that's an animal or, or you know, shares a common ontology with us. It's coming out of machine. And so there, there's a difference there. And I think it's really worth probing that to really understand and make sense of what is it that makes uh, people wonder if it's conscious and what makes it that makes so many of us think it's not conscious and what is the right criteria? Yeah. The so-called Turing test where um, independent people would determine whether answers are human or not um, seems to, in my estimation, be passe, that, that it'd be very easy for a, next, a, a future generation of, 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 uh, of the uh, large language learning models to pass the Turing test 
and and that would not convince me in any way that they've made progress towards a, towards consciousness. Yeah, so when you, when you kind of think about some of the big differences, one possibility is a place where it might end up being determinative, ter determinative in figuring out if a machine has been conscious is whether or not it's embodied. Um, there's even a great deal of philosophic work about something called embodied cognition and whether right. or not even consciousness is coherent in a disembodied context. Uh, these large language models, when they're in a cloud bouncing between different computers, uh, they, they don't have um, the same sense of like place and reality <laughs> <laughs> that, that really every other consciousness we've seen really has. And maybe they're consciousness, they're conscious, but, but maybe actually being bound to a body is a core aspect of being conscious. Yeah, uh, that, that's certainly an opinion. But I, I, can, I can imagine that consciousness could be disembodied. And in, in fact, in religious tradition, one of the criticisms of, of religion is that, uh, that, you know, if God is conscious, God is disembodied. So why don't you think consciousness could be disembodied? Well, it's true that, you know, uh, well, I mean, you know, I, don't, I don't know how to think about God's consciousness, to be honest. But one of the w interesting things about the Christian tradition, at least, is that you never actually see any human consciousness that's disembodied. Even like in the afterlife, you're given a new body. Mm. And so that, uh, that, that kind of leaves open this idea that maybe it's not actually possible to be conscious without, without a body, without even a, in the Christian a, tradition. Or, or, or a, a phys uh, some kind of instans instantiation of it. Uh, but I mean, you could, you could, I think, simulate. Can't you simulate a body in, in, in a computer just yeah. as easily? Well, you could, but let, let's, let's kind of go back to this idea of AI and could it be disembodied. Let's say I'm, I'm wrong here. You don't actually need to have a body to have like a true sentience or consciousness. That, that's entirely possible too. Like I said, no one really knows these answers. Right, right. Uh, I think what we could say though is a disembodied consciousness would be profoundly different than our consciousness. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same as ours. Think, think about whether or not, you know, if, if even humans like us, let's say we develop some technology, like happens sometimes in science fiction, like altered carbon, where we could actually balance our consciousness between different bodies. Mm. Uh, and so your body isn't really your body anymore. My body isn't my body in the same way. I mean, maybe this is a body I was born with, but I could also, I could jump into your body. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think pretty quickly, um, we'd start to realize there's some pretty large differences in the question of what it means to be human. Um, you know, am I still a male when I jump into a female body? <laughs> am I still an Indian if I jump into a white person's body? <laughs> and, you know, a hundred bodies later, am I still really human? <laughs> and also, you know, it also changes like the moral character of, you know, if I take out a gun and shoot someone in the head, have I, you know, have I really just, if I really murdered them or not, or just injured their body, but because their consciousness is there, it can go somewhere else. All, the, all these sorts of questions maybe are resolvable, but we would end up with a very, very different state of affairs as a philosopher might well, say that we and, currently and, have. And let, let's go back to transhumanism in general because we'll face some of these issues. They may not be as uh, philosophically grand, but as more and more of our um, uh, um, uh, intellectual anatomy can be converted into uh, non-biological substances. I mean, we already have cochlear implants. We have rudimentary uh, electronic eyes where people who are totally blind can actually begin to see more than just light and dark and you have some perception of remarkable work. Um, but this is just that it's opening stage, as you can imagine, in a few hundred years, maybe sooner, you, know, you can have really sophisticated um, um, of, uh, sensory extensions and then maybe even beyond in terms of replacing or augmenting brain tissue. So. At what point do you then have a different species? Well, yeah, so this gets to this question of like, how do you determine species over time? So, in, in, you know, in biology, there's this concept of a chrono species. So, a chrono species is, uh, you know, if you saw, you know, where humans were, for example, two million years ago, they'd be very different than humans we have today. Right. And if we put them next to each other, we would say they were clearly different species. For sure. But it's also possible that if you kind of look at the transition of forms over time, it's a, such a continuous transition that we'd say it's actually the same species. Yeah, because you can never see a sharp difference. Yeah, um, and, and so then it really, I mean, we certainly see this with Homo sapiens, right? So the, this, when do Homo sapiens arise? Is it around 100,000 years ago? Or is it around 300,000 years ago? It turns out there's a very, very smooth transition of forms in the fossils 
in that range. So where you put it, you know, if you look at the endpoints, they're different enough. You would obviously be able to tell the difference between mm. an early Homo sapien even and uh, and one of us. But the transition of forms is so smooth that it ends up being what's called a chrono species. Mm. Mm. It's chronologically unified, even though if you could just move them into the current moment, they'd be distinct. And I think what you're talking about here is probably really similar to that where, yeah, I mean, what it means to be human is really accelerating potentially when you think about how even, how even technology is having a feedback loop. We don't even have to have implants. I mean, everyone now uses a smartphone. Yeah. It's basically a type of cybernetic brain yeah. that we're just kind of constantly plugged into and it's <laughs> yeah. easy to swap out. I mean, yeah. it was actually like a brain modification would be a lot harder to swap out, right? Um, you know, to what extent is this really changing in fundamental ways our biology, how we think, how we process the world, and what the human experience is. It can, it's a fairly dramatic change, actually, in things like a smartphone. Uh, but there is a continuity there. So um, I think it'll probably be right to see us as a chrono species, even if the endpoint ends up being quite different.